Hey everybody, it's Christine Garvin and welcome to Hormonally Speaking. Glad that you are here with us this week. Um, I'm doing a little bit of a different interview today with a woman that I've known through uh, writing channels for, we were trying to figure out what year, and um, I think we came up with 2008, which is just crazy to me that we've known each other this long, <laughs> you know, through the internet and um, never in real life. And the reason that I invited her to be on this podcast is because she's such an inspiration on so many levels. And, and I think that you'll hear this in this interview. So let me start off by just telling you a little bit about her. Her name is Lola Akinmade, and she's an award-winning writer and photographer. And she has uh, photographed and dispatched from 70 plus countries for various publications. She is the 2018 Travel Photographer of the Year with the Bill, for the Bill Muster Award recipient. Her work has appeared in National Geographic Traveler, BBC, CNN, The Guardian, Travel and Leisure, Slate, Travel Channel, Adventure.com Magazine, AFAR, Lonely Planet, Fodders, several in-flight magazines, amongst others. She has collaborated with high-profile commercial brands for Mercedes-Benz and Dave to Intrep excuse me, and Dove to Intrepid Travel and National Geographic Channel. In addition to contributing to several books, she is the author of the following books, the 2018 Lowell Talmus Award winner for the best travel book, Due North, and best-selling La Gome, Swedish Secret of Living Well, available in 18 foreign language editions. And you'll have to tell me if I said that right. She has been recognized with multiple awards and nominations for her work, including a Pushcart Prize nomination, and was honored with a MyPad 100, that's the most influential people of African descent, award within media and culture in 2018. So as you can tell, just from her, you know, pretty short bio, she's done a lot, a lot, a lot. And I think she um, has such an incredible story. So welcome, Lola. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Christine. Yeah. I'm to be here. <laughs> I'm so excited that you're here amidst all of the chaos as we were just talking mm. about, right? Mm. It's, no, it's, I know. Yeah, definitely chaotic times. So you're in Sweden right now right? Yes. And you have been in Sweden for how long? It's going to, it's going on 11 years now. Okay. So that's quite some time. And then before that you were in the U S is that right? Yeah. So before that I was in the U S for 16 years. 16 and then years. before that I, uh, I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria and moved to the U S when I was 15 to go yeah. to college. So that's okay. kind of my trajectory. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> so, you know, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you was, did you really see as a young girl that you would end up, you know, being this, not just international traveler, but international liver, right? I mean, you've obviously <laughs> lived in very different places in the world. Yeah. Is that something yes. that, you know, was kind of a part of you from a young age? Well, I didn't know I was going to end up living in Sweden, but mm -hmm. I knew I was going to end up traveling. So mm -hmm. I was going to make travel my career and growing up in Nigeria, geography was my subject i loved geography i loved learning about different cultures about the world and so i knew i was going to make that part of my lifestyle mm -hmm. the way it's manifested itself you know mm -hmm. over the years has been really kind of humbling and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and exciting and so just with that love for travel i was also just very interested in writing mm -hmm. you know and photography and, and art and so just everything kind of came together Mm -hmm. You know, over the years when I started realizing as I traveled down this journey that this is what I like, this is what I don't like, and then do more of what you like, mm -hmm. and, you know, and then that kind of narrows that path until you find your own path towards I, your goal. I love that you brought that up. Um, I read recently... Oh, I, I can't remember. It was a woman that had been on Saturday Night Live um, in, in the 80s, and she said it was horrendous, you know, just a horrendous mm. experience. And she promised herself at that point that she would only forever after take jobs that felt fun, you know, and that, mm. She, mm. that she felt that sense of like, I love this, you know. And yes. um, that's pretty much what has led to her, her success ever since then, you know, and, and I think that um, I, I love hearing that bit of wisdom because I, I think so many times I, I felt like, okay, well, I got to slog through these things to get to where I want to go, you know, and it mm. doesn't make sense on a deep level, right, to continue to do things that you don't like doing in order to supposedly get to where you want to go. 
Co correct. You know, and the thing is that sometimes we do have responsibilities that kind of take us off that path. Mm -hmm. And I understand, you know, if you've got kids, if, you've, if you're a caretaker, if there mm -hmm. are other bills you have to pay, I understand that. But also I am a big advocate for slowly chipping away, mm -hmm. you know, towards where you really want to go. Mm -hmm. And look at it this way. If you go into something, maybe just for the money, mm -hmm. then when times get really tough, then just emotionally it's going to drain you. But mm -hmm. if you go something into something because you're passionate about it, mm -hmm. you're going to be a lot more resilient. So, so that when it does dip, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you're still going to have that passion. It's not right. because you know, this is what you want to do. It's just that life is taking you a, a different route right now. So it's, right. I think it's, um, I'm very grateful that I found my passion very mm -hmm. early on. Mm -hmm. And that has, that's what has been able to help me focus Mm -hmm. in terms of using you know focus that this is the you know I, and there's something i always say i always say that travel really isn't the passion mm -hmm. there is something that allows us to use travel as the avenue mm -hmm. to express the passion mm -hmm. so for example you're a dancer you know mm -hmm. when i say you you dance that's your passion right mm -hmm. you could use travel Mm -hmm. as a way of expressing that so you could be a, a, a dancer who goes to different cultures and explores dance in different cultures mm -hmm. or you could be a dancer for a for a dance company you know but mm -hmm. the passion itself is the same right and right. so I always say your passion is what you can do both on the road and mm -hmm. at home mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know I, yeah, that brings up for me, you know, I want to get back to, because I want to hear your story of, of moving to the U.S., but I, what you're saying just brings up for me, you know, I, one of the things I've admired in watching you just, you know, blossom over these past 12 years is, you know, I'm amazed that you've had a family, that you've done all of these things, and then are so successful in your work, and I'm like, she's got to be just, like, you must have really set boundaries around everything but I'm really curious if you can give us an idea of sort of how you I don't want to say do it all but you know how you really chip away as, as you were mentioning you know because I think a lot of people yes. really struggle uh, with that. I, no absolutely and I think um, you know one of it is also delegating what can be delegated so mm -hmm. for example you know with social media I have two other people that help me with social media right yeah you know mm -hmm. so some of some of that can be delegated I think once you find out this is where you want to go then it's easier to say no to tasks mm -hmm. that pull you off that and and so I work on larger pain assignments mm -hmm. and then the bylines which I call them vanity bylines right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the really big name publications mm -hmm. they don't pay that much mm -hmm. Uh, and over the years, I've kind of stopped chasing them. I only chase if I would like to get the byline to right. help Buster. Yeah. But I focus on the publications that are maybe not as popular, but they pay a lot more. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, trying to use your work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, then, and then I'm very grateful in that I live in a country that does understand work-life balance mm -hmm. you know yeah. and so that kind of helps a lot in terms of flexibility I mean you know the kids in school in the U.S. that will be at least two to three thousand dollars a month yeah. just to send kids to school in Sweden it's like 150 bucks like wow. it's you know and yep. so I'm there's a there. lot of <laughs> <laughs> but, but see, the, fl the flip side is that I pay a lot of taxes, mm -hmm. you know, so that's, a, so that's, right, your, right, know, that's true, so, that's true, so, yeah. so, so when I see, the, you know, when I get those, I'm like, oh my god, yeah, yeah like, no, but, but, but I also see where the taxes go, you know, and yeah. so it's all about work-life balance, and so, and, and then with my husband, right, so my husband, he doesn't work, he goes to school full-time, you mm. know, and he used to be a journalist mm -hmm. when I met him, okay, and when, and when I met him, I was a programmer, which mm, meant I made like, right. like, which, which made I already made three times what I did when right. I met him. Right. You know, and, and now it doesn't work. He go, he's, he's trying to go back. Um, he's back in school now to switch degrees so mm -hmm. he can become a teacher. So the point of me saying that is that I'm not, I didn't marry into a very, like right. I didn't marry a rich right. guy. You know? You're so, like, so, I'm not taken care of over here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, that, so, so I think it, it comes down to trying to make smart choices, getting support where you need it, mm -hmm. delegating, focusing, and knowing that 
that if this is what you really want to do, you're going to find time to do it. Like mm-hmm. people say, oh, I don't have enough time in the day. Yeah, you actually do mm-hmm. if it's something you really want to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Does that yes. mean for you sometimes you like get up way early or stay up way late to get things done? Or yeah. Yeah, sometimes. Better? Yeah, okay. Sometimes, but, but also I actually do get sleep. You know, so mm-hmm. people are like, she, she probably doesn't sleep. I'm like, well, I actually fall asleep with the kids at like around, 8.39. That's good. You know, and, then, yeah. and then by the time I wake up, and, and it's by mistake. It's just yeah, that yeah, I'm yeah, tired. You're, like, <laughs> I'm, you're just I'm done, really, yeah. <laughs> exactly, I just pass out. <laughs> you know? But then by the time you wake up, you wake up at 3.34 p.m. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And then, then you've already slept like at least six mm-hmm. hours at least, you know, and, mm-hmm. and some, sometimes even more. So, so yes, you know, um, I do get enough sleep and it's, I actually wrote a blog post and I'll share that with you about okay. how I stay productive. Mm, that would be great. Because, I'll put the notes. Yes, because what I do is I actually don't have a long to-do list. I mm. actually have three to four daily tasks, nice. right? Mm-hmm. So instead of, putting, instead of me writing a long to-do list, when I see that list, it freaks me out. Like, oh yeah. my God, these are all the things. But there are some times I don't even have to look at a, a task until two months from now right Mm -hmm. so why am i looking at it today on a to-do list exactly Mm -hmm. and so what i actually do is i break out and 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 in this post it really clearly outlines how i stay productive like three tasks a day Mm -hmm. and and if if i want to for example enter a contest and the contest deadline is next month i don't even put it on my list until like a week before the deadline Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how i've mentally spaced out Mm-hmm. my schedule to that, stay productive yeah. and to mentally, you know, to stay Well, I think that's, yeah. that's really important because it's so much of getting things done is that mental aspect, right? And when we um, set things up to where it's just instant overwhelm when we look at it, a lot of us shut down, right? Or we procrastinate. I mean, I have been exactly. there a million times. You know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 And especially when you have kids and all those things going on, you can easily kind of procrastinate and not get the things Ex- done. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that's what I've actually, and I have to say that has really, truly helped me over the years mm-hmm. because if I have, for example, three articles to write, mm-hmm. I'm not going to put them on my to-do list as three articles to write. I'm mm-hmm. just going to say today, start article one tomorrow continue article one Mm. the third day start article two Mm -hmm. that kind of just mentally spaces so i don't feel like i have a lot to do it's just daily to do kind of short tasks and and so you kind of create that that task list every day or do you you have some no i space them out i i I space them out so i use a one note Mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. I can and and so and I have like my little color coding system as well mm-hmm. so I can so I just put them um, you know I'm sure there there's so many scheduling tools mm-hmm. but I really right. like OneNote because yeah. it's just like I'm writing an outline mm-hmm. I just write the date I put the outline that 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 tomorrow that that, that. I just see it and yeah. then as I go through I delete so yeah. so it's not so I don't think like, oh, what did I do last week? What, what am I doing tomorrow? You know? Yeah, yeah. So it feels so good when you hit that delete too, right? <laughs> You're exactly. Like, and then no, it clears it, you know? Yeah, and, then it's, yeah. and, and then it just, so, so, so even though it feels like a to-do list, there's a date yeah. where I'm not supposed to even look at it until March 31st or right. until May 1st. Right, right, right. Gotcha. Yeah, so, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. So that was probably a little tangential. I'm like, that was for me more than maybe anybody else. But, um, going back to, you know, you moved to the U.S., you said, for college when you were 16. How yes. did that come about? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, so I was, I actually finished uh, high school early. So I finished when I was 15. And then when I was going to go to college in Nigeria, mm-hmm. the universities went on strike. Mm. you know and so I traveled to the U.S. on vacation and I had um, you know my uncle and aunt lived there mm-hmm. and so I stayed with them and then I switched my uh, visitor's visa to a student visa mm. to start school and you're so like, I started I'm, I'm school. here <laughs> yeah, you're like so, let's yeah. do this <laughs> yeah so well because the university was still on strike you know and right so right like, right okay we need I need to start and so that's kind of how I started and my my degrees are actually in information systems and mm. geography. Mm-hmm. So very kind of more technical. And, and I worked as a programmer for over 15, uh, 12, 13 yeah. years. 
Well, I'm sure that and helped you initially to, you know, even as simple as like set up your own website and kind of yes. know how to connect in that way. Maybe before yeah. a lot of people knew how to do that, right? right? Was yeah, that, yeah. You couldn't I'm, do these like drag and drop websites back then. So. No, 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 yeah. no. I mean, I, I was like a programmer, programmer. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, by the time I, I kind of advanced in that career, I was a system architect, a tech lead, which mm. meant I was leading the technical implementation on a big project with different yeah. programs. Yeah. So, so, uh, so that career, I was good at my job. Like mm-hmm. I knew. That You're was like, like done. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, um, but I also knew that um, writing was a passion, you know, mm-hmm. photography. And I wanted to, I wanted that more creative aspects yeah. of my life. So were you, are, I imagine in that job, you were probably already writing, you know, I mean, technically, yes. but you were writing, were you taking uh, photographs this whole time too? Like just as a hobby? Yeah, yeah as yeah. a hobby. And actually when we met, which was in mm-hmm. 2008, I was still a programmer, just working. That's, I, I do remember <laughs> that. Yeah. So, You're doing so, this little so, side so, gig. Yeah. <laughs> so this was, so all the writing was a side gig back then, but uh, the photography came about more by accident. Mm. So, um, I, I used to be an oil painter. Mm. And so when I, so when I travel somewhere, I take a picture of a scene I want to paint when I get mm-hmm. back. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I was using photography for. Gotcha. Until, until I realized, I think I was duplicating effort. <laughs> like, I <could> actually, <laughs> <laughs> like I could actually, like I could actually just um, use photography as a right. new medium. Right. You know, of exploring. Like, ding, ding, ding. Yep. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that's why, like, if you see my work, it's usually like very kind of vibrant with a uh, lot of eye contrast and yeah. it's because that's how I edit it because mm. I used to be an oil painter so I'm a bit more heavy handed in this you know in the vibrancy or the contrast in the photo it's because I used to be an oil painter that's that why. makes so much sense because that's something I've noticed about your photography is the the vividness of the colors you know and yes. the kind of striking yeah. um, aspect of of what you capture I'll definitely, you know, in the notes, um, link to obviously your website and anything else because I want people to see your photography because it's it's really it's very really powerful. So thank you. Glad thank you. you got into that <laughs> and out of programming. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know. So what well, was that you know, final <laughs> moment where you actually were like, okay, I'm done with programming and I'm going to do this writing, this photography thing, like full time. Well, I think the the real flip came. It was actually in 2002. That was when the seed was planted. Mm-hmm. Was um, There was an expedition race at the time called the Eco Challenge. Mm. And it was happening in Fiji. And they were looking for volunteers to just kind of help with this expedition, right? Mm-hmm. In Fiji. And I'm like, oh my God. You know, I'd never even heard of Fiji at that time. I was just like, yeah. oh my God, this sounds amazing. So I went and my job as a volunteer was to be on their web team. Mm. which meant I was supposed to write stories every day, take okay. some photos. And then we were supposed to update the website every day with news about the race. Mm. Like, oh, the, or like the, the athletes just came out through Navala village or la la la, or this mm. is an, an interview with an athlete. or this is what Navala village looks and feels like. Mm-hmm. So it was while I was there, I was like, Oh my God, I think this is it. Yeah. This is a career. Was, I'm actually, Mm-hmm. that was it you know I actually remember the exact moment I was standing in the middle of a river like just wasted and I'm like oh my god this is it I can be writing about this rich kind of experiences around the world yeah you know t- the water told share- you <laughs> I know the water told me <laughs> before I try to ca- before I try to carry me away you know <laughs> what a metaphor <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. So, so so I came back and so that was when I started kind of plotting my like how how can I move away from being a programmer mm. and I think when I found that it was around 2007 that was actually kind of the first one of the first places I pitched my writing to and then mm. you know the rest is history so yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> well so yeah we were at Matador I don't I don't remember I think you were still there maybe when I left um, yes uh, but you know, that was that 2008 to, I God, I can't remember when I left, maybe 2010 or 11. Yeah, you know, 2010, I think, was when I, I left. I okay, think. okay. Maybe you might have yeah. left before me then. I can't quite remember. Yeah. But but so yeah. at that point, you know, you obviously, I mean, I remember even while we were at Matador, you started writing for some of these bigger publications, you yes. know? And, 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 so, and, I, and I had no experience. Yeah, and, you know, so how did you do it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
but just by being audacious right mm. and that's what i tell people i'm like mm. don't be scared of rejection mm-hmm. i get rejected every single day mm-hmm. <laughs> you know like mm-hmm. you know and and that's why i tell people is if you're audacious what's the worst that could happen when you pitch a big publication mm-hmm. they ignore you mm-hmm. what's the best what's the best that could happen they, they accept respond. you <laughs> yeah yeah exactly mm-hmm. and so i was audacious with no clips with nothing i just mm. wrote i'm like you know what i know how to tell a good story mm-hmm. i've taken these photos i i think this would be a great story and i was able to sell mm-hmm. my work mm-hmm. even if it wasn't a lot even if yeah. it was just like oh i just came back from nigeria and i took a you know like five photos of like fishermen yeah i was able to tell a story about that mm-hmm. and be able to communicate that truth mm-hmm. and that's why and that's why it's important for people to find what they are truly passionate about mm-hmm and pitch from that point because it comes true right it, com- it, com- it really comes true well and i want to add you know as you were talking what came to me is you know not just your passion but there was a belief in yourself right you're yes. like i know that i write well i know that i take good photographs and i think that's a place that is hard for people sometimes you know especially with these newer yes. things right it's to come from that belief place in themselves so do you feel like that's something you just have always naturally had or is that something that you've worked hard to get i think i think th- there is some base foundation mm-hmm. there but then it's something you work hard to get and mm-hmm. First, I'm a black woman, I'm an African woman, and I'm a woman, you know? Right, so right, exactly, things, you're like, got all the things. <laughs> Go I got all the me, three, yeah. and, and so just trying to work in an industry that's predominantly white male, like, and not just any white male, but white guys that look like they just came down from Everest. <laughs> <laughs> looking all rugged and yep. then go, go go post for GQ. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, like how, do I, how do I convince an editor right. to choose me mm-hmm. above that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of persistence. It was a lot of saying, you know what? I'm not going to take rejection personally, mm. but I know the quality of my work, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And, I know? And I know that, you know, yes, there are people that might be better and yes, there are people, you know, I could be better, but... I know what I can do. And that's mm-hmm. where I, I try to pitch. And I think for people that are creative, we, we tend to take rejection more personally than mm-hmm. we should. Mm-hmm. Than we should. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's kind of like somebody saying, you know, your baby's ugly. I don't mm-hmm. like your baby. You know, and, right. and that is a very, like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I know and that's a very personal thing, you yeah. know? And so, so that's why for over 10 years, and actually for 10 years, I was publicly, publishing what I called my pitching chats, right? Mm-hmm. So I will publicly publish how many pitches I mm-hmm. sent that mm-hmm. year, mm-hmm. how many were accepted, how many were rejected, how mm-hmm. many are in limbo, how many got no responses. Mm-hmm. And then I will self-analyze based on that. Mm. So, so, and all you really use that programmer mind to to, to, to like kind of figure it out. Yeah. 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 But because you need to figure out, okay, what's not working Mm -hmm. and then you have to cost correct. Mm -hmm. And so that was what has helped me Mm -hmm. self assess over Mm -hmm. the years. I make changes every year and I'll give you an example. Okay. If I sent a lot of pictures and the editors kept coming back to me and saying, no, thank you. We'll pass. We just published this. We pass. We just published this. Mm -hmm. To me, mm-hmm. that says you didn't do your homework. That mm-hmm. says you did not read the previous publications, right? Like the previous issues. Mm-hmm. So read them before mm-hmm. you pitch. Mm-hmm. Or, or if, or if the editor said, um, uh, you know, oh, sorry, we've, we've just commissioned something similar, or we've just commissioned something similar, then that means I was too late mm-hmm. when the event happened mm-hmm. to pitch them. Right. So right, right. That, so things like that. Those are things that a lot of writers don't understand that's what's important to help self-assess and then right. you know fine-tune their pitching and and create something more solid right and that will help over the years so all this is publicly out there on my website i'll send you the link so that's awesome see. yeah well yeah. and i think it's such a good valid point for so many things in life right not just our careers and what we're going after you know i i feel like this is a lesson that i've 
personally just learned in a much bigger way over the past few years. You know, I, I used to hate any kind of criticism, you know, I was mm. just like, and I would kind of like really shy away from the possibility of it. Cause it just that, that set sense of like your baby's ugly, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, it, I think just over time of doing some inner work, it, it's a shift to be able to see these things as, I don't want to, you know, I, I, some people will call it like an opportunity. And I don't know if I, I would put it in an opportunity to, to do better, but to really look at it as, you know, this is all, this whole thing, this life is just mm. us seeing, you know, hopefully witnessing what we're doing and then just trying to get a little bit better at it, right? It's kind of a yeah. game. And when you can kind of get yourself out of the you know, feeling of, um, rejection or um, shame. I think a lot of times shame comes up for people, yes. right? Mm. When you <laughs> kind of learn how to really work with that and see this, okay, oh, actually now I can see this is how I can get better. Like this is helping mm. me to get better. And, I, I, you know, I know that just saying that, it, you know, people have heard that before and, and that they can be like, well, it's easy enough to say, but when you're in it, but there is a distinct shift when you start to believe that on a deeper level Yes, and, and yeah. it, you're not held back as much. Right. And th this is true in health. Like, you know, so often um, just working with clients on hormone stuff, it's like they hit these walls around things, you know, and I'm like, mm. this is really an opportunity for you to learn more about your body and this yes. is going to serve you as you continue on this this journey and this path you know so mm -hmm. I, just, I really loved that that you brought that up and I wanted to bring it around all, yeah, to all no, absolutely yeah. yes no absolutely it is a learning experience and I think a lot of people you know we fear you know everybody has some level of imposter syndrome oh, yeah. so they feel like For okay sure. I'm, I'm not yeah. good and you know so there's yep. that we're battling against we're battling against shame we're battling against rejection mm -hmm. and one of the things that you know I'll put on my photographer at right now and, mm -hmm. and say, you know, I like photographing people, mm -hmm. especially strangers, mm. but with strangers, what comes because a lot of people are scared of photographing strangers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the reason we are scared is because of the shame and the rejection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know? And, and so once you start putting yourself in those kind of situations where you get rejected a lot, mm -hmm. rejection kind of loses its thing mm -hmm. after a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, It really does. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, remember, I think it was in uh, the Game Changers book, um, Dave Asprey, who's Bulletproof. Um, his stuff is the Bulletproof, you know, diet and, and drink and all that. But he interviewed a guy that set out on an experiment to basically do, I don't know if it was once a day or multiple times a day for a certain amount of time, to ask for things that he knew he, knew he would get rejected like mm. that he wouldn't get them so that he could become accustomed to rejection. So it wouldn't <laughs> sting as much. Right. But yeah. also what was fascinating in the experiment was that he found that more people said yes than no yeah. in situations that he asked exactly. for crazy things. And he was like, Oh, <laughs> you know, people really actually on the whole want to help. They want to help you yeah. get it done. And so it's such a mind flip to, to think that that way, you know, and also to exactly build up that, you know, that strength against the, the rejection. So it's not as, um, it doesn't impact you as much anymore. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so going back to, I'm glad that you brought up about, you know, being a black woman in this industry, which is full of white men, which is a lot of industries, right? <laughs> yeah. In a lot of ways. And then you've obviously lived, you know, I mean, in the U S where racism is a big issue. And then Sweden is obviously a very white country. You know, yes. I don't know much about what um, the race issues are like in Sweden, but I'm just curious, like, you're, you're such a, an amazing example, you know, it, it's, I, I mean, when you're a, a just black person, it's mm -hmm. so incredibly hard in this world, but if you're a black yeah. woman, <laughs> yes. you know, yes. it's like, it's, it's just, yes. like you have so many things against you. And I know mm -hmm. so many black women that work so hard. And they, mm. it's really hard for them to get out of, of that place because of what society, you know, puts on them on a daily basis. So I'm just curious, really, like how you've dealt with that in all of these kinds okay. of situations. You've been Absol in. Absolutely. And, and so one of the things that I do is, mm -hmm. and that's also like with Sweden, why I wrote the book, Logum, mm -hmm. which is about the Swedish mentality mm -hmm. is, I love culture. I, mm -hmm. I love kind of exploring the nuances of culture. I did mm -hmm. this in the US, you know, in Nigeria. Sweden 
and I also try to pull out what makes us similar, what makes us different. Mm-hmm. And, and then like with the book, I, I call that uh, if you're knocking your head against the wall, the book shows you how to walk around the wall and just keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. Because, because racism also you know, exists here and it's mm-hmm. a different kind of racism mm-hmm. than in the US. Mm-hmm. And so in the US, it's more in your face. Mm. but people still discuss it mm-hmm. you know like it's not that it's quiet like we talk about race on tv as we should mm-hmm. because if we do not talk about it then that means we're not acknowledging other people's pain mm-hmm. so in the years we talk about it in the u.s i could be like oprah winfrey if i wanted to mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the u.s in the u.s if there is a racist that hates me mm-hmm. at least the racist doesn't doubt who i am Mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so so there's a racist that hates oprah winfrey but the racist doesn't doubt that oprah winfrey is super powerful is, she, <laughs> yeah. is too, is super powerful and yeah. she's smart enough to do what she wants he just doesn't like her that she's black right in sweden it's a kind of more subtle condescending racism so mm-hmm. it's more of like uh oh are you a doctor then you must be really smart mm-hmm. to be a doctor gotcha. so it's a mm-hmm. different kind of condescension mm-hmm. so in sweden it's a great place to live in a corner quietly. Mm -hmm. They're not going to disturb you. They're Mm -hmm. going to give you great quality of life. But the minute I say I want to be the CEO of of, uh, Ericsson or Ikea, Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. when the problem Mm -hmm. starts, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it's, it's a country that tries to just kind of force people into different boxes. Like, okay, you're here. This is your corner. This is your corner. See, everybody is happy. Kumbaya. Right. Don't leave your corner. (laughs) <laughs> right, 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 right. You're, you're like, not kumbaya. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. Yeah. Do you, do you no, think no, that no. that conversation is, um, is going to come more over time? Or do you think it's kind of just because well, the country's insulated? So, so the thing is that it's a conversation that's, uh, that's, uh, that is coming and is mm-hmm. being had. But before you have conversations, you have to understand the tapestry of a culture, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, I, so, I have a, so I know a lot of American friends that are like, la, 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 just all aggressive that, well, Sweden, you know, is, mm-hmm. this, is, this is how it should be. I'm like, mm-hmm. you have to first of all understand mm-hmm. how the mindset of a certain people work. Right, right. You, you, know, you understand? Mm-hmm. Before you can start having the conversation yep. in different capacities. Absolutely. So being a black being a black woman in Sweden is different from being a black woman in America. You yeah. can apply both yeah. kind of yeah. ways into doing it, especially when you're working with a culture that's naturally reserved mm-hmm. or, or it's a culture of it's a culture that um kind of starts as mindfulness where they give you space mm-hmm. but it then becomes lack of acknowledgement mm-hmm. because they're giving you space, space right so right. it's so so it's a very so so you can't just i always say that if you're gonna fight a battle or a war you need to understand you need to come up with your own strategy or, yeah. or at least understand what the landscape looks like yeah. you can't just go fight a war in the same way you fight in a different place right so that's uh Yes. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because you're really a studier of cultures, right? I mean, that's what yes. you do in your work is you yes. know, study through photographing people and getting to know them and writing about them. So I, you know, I, I think it's a very fascinating take, your experience of living in Sweden and, and what you're saying of like understanding the culture before um, having that conversation because you yeah. get that deep sense of, yeah, there's this, this foundation. Um, and you can't, I mean, so often, and I'm going to go back to health here for a second because, um, it, you know, it relates and not as an impactful way, but so often, you know, with, with food, people will say, Oh, the Japanese eat this kind of diet and they're super healthy. Correct. Right. Yeah. And then we'll try and put yes. it on, you know, people that are, have European heritage and that is not, it's not going to wor- work the same, you know, like our, yeah. our genes yeah. do have an impact on us. Um, Correct. And yes. so it's like, you, you, we try and always just um, extrapolate from one situation and put it onto another. Exactly. And that's, yeah. that's no, it, never going to work. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't work, you know, like 100% that way, you know, like, for example, in the, in the U.S., you know, if I, just even culturally, I can be two things, right? So I can be Japanese American, mm-hmm. Chinese American, mm-hmm. uh, African American, Italian American. In Sweden, it feels like you, you can either be one or the other. Mm. right oh, interesting. so it's still yeah so it's still not even at the point where i can be like oh i am italian swedish 
Yeah. Oh, I am. You know, so now it's just now Afro sweet, and I'm saying, you know what, I'm Afro Swedish, you know, and, and trying to say, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean mm-hmm. I'm not integrating. That doesn't mean I'm not, you know, you know, accepting cultural elements. It just mm-hmm. means I can be both. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that's so that's so that's why I say sometimes when, you know, Americans just kind of talk about, oh, this is how it should be there. Mm-hmm. You have to understand the landscape first. Yeah. And then absolutely. have the conversation based on from that landscape. Right. Because it's still a landscape that still wants you to be one or the other. And you're like, right. no. You're like, no. And I'm grateful. <laughs> no, no. I'm like, yeah. no, I'm Nigerian, American, Sweden, like, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, there must, it seems like there's definitely a level of um, that culture that you love a lot, right? Because you've written yes. a book about it. You have, you yes. oversee a website about it, right? Too. Yeah. And, yeah. So yeah. while the website is more just the, what to do in Stockholm, gotcha. you know, like to, as a slow traveler. So it's mm-hmm. just more kind of resources and ways to explore the, mm-hmm. the city, you know, slower. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. But still like there's definitely, yeah, this, yes. this, you know, connection and beauty. And that's I, what I love about your work is you, there always feels like a connection to place when you, when yes. you look at your work, you know? So um, what about yeah. in terms of like, you know, I know, I mean, going back to the white male thing, when uh, <laughs> going, going to, you know, some of these big conferences and things like that, these travel, writing and photography mm. and I'm, my guess is I haven't been to any of them but that's filled with a lot of um, white males you know yeah. how how um were you you know when you first started going to stuff like that how did people mm. react to you how did those guys in particular react to you well in the beginning it was more of an entitlement like why are you in my space mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know even even if they are mediocre mm-hmm. <laughs> you right, know it's right, like right. this like this is just my space you shouldn't be there yeah. you know? and then i'm like and, and for me you can't tell me and i think that's growing up in nigeria right so i grew up in nigeria where we're just everybody looks like you right mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. nobody was telling me that i couldn't do something because i was black mm-hmm. and so and so when i moved to the US and maybe people are trying to tell me you can't do this because you're black I'm like you have to give me a stronger reason because yeah, that yeah, doesn't yeah. make sense <laughs> that ain't gonna work <laughs> sorry my friend yeah, for yeah. Me. And, and, yeah. But, and, but that's how I grew up and mm-hmm. so I think for me that also helped in terms of like when people came to try and put me in a box I'm like why are you mm-hmm. trying to do this is it because of my color of my skin okay so that doesn't make sense because mm-hmm. I grew up in a place where everybody looked like me and was right. were excellent you know right. so are uh, still excellent so what yeah you know, and so I think over time, just kind of also being true to your voice, putting your own work out there and, and uh, not being afraid. Like I said, I'm very audacious, mm-hmm. you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and if I wasn't, I wouldn't be afraid, right. where, you know. So, so if I see and I feel like I, I need to be there, I'm going to try to yeah. get there, you know, yeah. and be like, no, my voice needs to be there too. I mean, uh, my voice is representing other voices that need to be here as well. Yeah, because yep. if this if these guys are going to places and writing from their own point of view, and I go to the same place, and I don't get the same experience, mm-hmm. we need to be we need to be sharing a balanced view of the place. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right? Yep. And so mm-hmm. uh, and so I always give an example like, you know, um, for example, if you know, uh, I'll, I'll say a white lady this you know goes maybe goes to a place and she's just warmly invited into a culture and like. Oh, I met this local family and they brought me into their house and they made dinner and I met the grandma. It was beautiful. <laughs> and, and, I, and I read a post. I'll be like, oh my God, I want that same experience. And then I go there. And yeah. then because I'm black, I don't get that right, same. Right, right, but right. Because, right. So, so, so when I come back, stories of the place need to be balanced. Otherwise, yeah. it's just going to be like, this like, is our one point. Well, we romanticize a lot of times other cultures exactly. and especially indigenous cultures, right? Which I yes, mean, I know yes. I was caught up in that for a lot of years. And I mean, there's amazing, amazing things about all indigenous yeah. cultures. And then they also have their bad things or they're not yeah, so exa- things, yeah. like everybody, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and we're all human. And, and that's one of the things that should always kind of be some balance. And the, mm. thing is, and the thing is that that diversifies and makes the stories we tell more complete Mm -hmm. you know more Mm -hmm. just fuller and richer Mm -hmm. you know or sometimes i may have an amazing experience because i'm a minority in a place and have access because people see themselves in me right but like if a white person went they may not give as much access right so that all so that's why it's important to diversify the kind of stories we tell Mm -hmm. by keeping the space open so Mm -hmm. so it's not just a particular point of view you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, and you know, with everything you're saying, I was just thinking about like, this is why you're such an inspiration to me and and why I wanted Mm -hmm. you to be on here for women, you know, that I think um, in general can get beat down around a lot of things, right? Yes. And um, feel um, out of place, feel that they aren't good enough, all of these different things. And so, you know, the fact that um, you brought up being audacious a few times, I think Mm -hmm. is really, really, really important. Um, as a reminder that we keep having to bring ourselves back to that, even if Mm -hmm. we're scared, even if we have fear, even if we're introverts, you know, to find that passion, to find um, that thing that we know that we're good at and really come Mm -hmm. back to that place of knowing and then, you know, be audacious, right? Like that's what it it has to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I recently gave a TEDx talk. Yes, that's right. The title was called The Power of Asking Why Not. Mm. And and the reason I give that talk is because in addition to being audacious, we have to keep asking why not. Why am I not allowed into this room? Why is this door closed to me? Why not? Because the more you ask it, the more you be I mean, the three reasons I gave is that it can be a code of opening uh, of understanding, Mm -hmm. right? Because somebody uh, might already have a prejudice view. Mm-hmm. But when you ask them why not, it forces them to re-examine why, mm-hmm. why not? Why am I not giving this? And then you actually expose their own bias to them. Mm-hmm. Right. Even if they, if they feel like they, even if some people are like, no, I'm not, I'm not racist. But you're like, well, right. why not? Yeah. Why are you not? Yeah, and then it right. Exposes them. And, then, and then another why not is also that it makes us, um, it actually can push us to live in, to live the best version of our own lives right mm-hmm. so if some if we keep asking why not sometimes we want to do it to prove that look i can do this why not me mm-hmm. of course mm-hmm. i can do it mm-hmm. but once you start living your life beyond other people's expectations mm-hmm. then you become impossible to ignore yeah. you just become impossible to ignore right so that was so that was for me the power of why not why mm-hmm. so in addition to being audacious keep asking why not that's like so, not? I love that angle because I haven't ever thought about that before. I'm going to go watch your TEDx talk <laughs> after we're done. But it's, it's so true. And particularly right now with this instability that we're facing in the world for, mm. you know, at least the next few months, if not longer. I mean, I'm sure it'll impact us, you know, even longer than that. But it, it's kind of this perfect opportunity to ask why not, right? It's like when everything gets flipped on its head that you've known, right? And that you thought mm-hmm. you had to be and that you thought that you were, um, your life was, you know, it's like mm-hmm. all that's being mm-hmm. kind of changed for a lot of people. And exactly. that's super scary, but it also is this opportunity to ask, you know, why not? Why, why is now not the time for me to do this, Correct. this thing, Correct. right? So, yeah. yeah. Super powerful. But also, but also what, what I, one of the talks I gave is called, uh, you know, looking at transitions in our lives as opportunities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this is an horrendous time we're going through. I mean, people are losing their lives. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't know when the cure will be. There's so much uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And this is a transition everybody's going through, you mm-hmm, know. So, mm-hmm. if, so if, if you were tied, if your success was tied to what you did, Mm-hmm. right right and then that is taken then who are you who are you yeah and so mm-hmm. so this is so this is an opportunity for people to rediscover who they are mm-hmm. once again to say what am i who am i truly at my core mm-hmm. um this is an opportunity for them to discover their strengths mm-hmm. what they are good at am i good at problem solving am i resilient am i you can start finding those strengths this is an opportunity for people to drop the masks. Yes. So yep. if, you've, if, you, if you've had a bogus on, online social media, like persona, yeah. now is an opportunity to just use this, like yeah. use this opportunity to just drop it. Yeah. Because, because there are people that are burning out and feeling like they have to keep a certain look, certain yeah. way every time. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and they've, over time, they're, they're dying inside, but they can't show it outside. Absolutely. Because they have to... Because they have to, the angles have to be great. They have to be an but, influencer or what have you. Yeah. yeah. Yep. This is a great opportunity. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Just be an opportunity right now to just drop that so you can reinvent and be like, oh, now I'm more yeah. real. Now I'm my more authentic self and this is not as important. Yeah. You know, and so they're just, you know, many ways to look at this transition point as opportunities to, to grow, to reevaluate, to reprioritize. So. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting that you bring that up in the authenticity piece, because I feel like that's been kind of a, 
an undercurrent here for the last maybe like, you know, two to three years where people are, are exhausted of, of the mask and exhausted of yes. trying to keep up on that level and not necessarily finding it makes them successful anyway. Like that was kind yeah. of the point. Right. And so yes. you've seen the slow and undercurrent happening of people trying to, you know, or showing up more authentically, it feels like in social media. Um, but still, there's still being a huge wave of the influencers yes. and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. now we have this huge thing out of our control control that's happened in the yeah. world that's really yes. just kind of cut all that out that stuff that doesn't matter up here right Correct. and the authenticity Correct. has the opportunity to rise right if yeah absolutely that. yeah absolutely and, and the thing is that you know and I think it was Brené Brown that said it is like you don't have to talk about like your bikini wax or something to be authentic <laughs> but you can talk about <laughs> right. I, I, don't, so what, I don't know what it was but but like, like oversharing doesn't we, really we definitely don't need to know about your bikini wax. <laughs> yeah, but I know, but I know, no, she, I, I think that was what she said. I can't remember, right. but she was something quiet it. like that. Yeah. But it was something about like, there's a difference between being vulnerable and, and being authentic and being and oversharing. Right. Because our society has equated oversharing with being authentic. Right. You're right. That's, that's like the, the, and, the uh, yeah, other side of the sword or whatever the double. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and so, you know, I feel like I'm authentic online, even if I don't post photos of my family on yeah. Instagram. Right. Yeah. You know, there are ways I can, you can still be authentic with while still keeping some privacy. Privacy. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and I think, and I think, you know, that's just for me. Everybody's of course you can live your life the way yeah. you want. But I think, um, you know, sometimes there's some things that just need to be, for you there are some things you need to yeah. protect so there are some things you know especially in this crazy crazy world yeah i so. think there's there's a lot of value to that you know and i get it yeah. like everybody you know um feels comfortable sharing on different levels and and what it yes. does to them but but understanding the value of some things in life being kind of sacred you know and that yes. being yeah it doesn't need to be shared in this big way for you to Go um yeah to to yeah. you know live a successful life or anything correct like so, yeah. but but also there's also like if you're also going through something mm -hmm. that you feel like would help other women mm -hmm. that's also okay you know like mm -hmm. you know for example you know if you um you know for example you're a prime example of going through just that incredible mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. just you sharing it made people sit up Mm -hmm. listen like oh if this could happen to christine oh my god you know and mm -hmm. then take care of their health more and just so so that's important that's what mm -hmm. that's good mm -hmm. sharing yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? like because yeah. it inspires and it uplifts and it and it changes the discussion and it puts a face on something that people don't know yeah a lot about yeah. you know so that's so that's that's what i mean good sharing yep Bad sharing is just like I just got the bikini wax today, you know, and whatever. <laughs> right, right. You know, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> too different and, for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm good. I don't need to know that. But yeah, yeah no, I, I, you know, one of the things people will often say to me, they'll, you know, say, thank you for sharing all of that experience. And, you know, I, why I recommend particularly, you know, if, if you, if a woman or anyone is dealing with chronic illness or, you know, different things that they yes. felt like they've had to hide, um, how healing it can actually be to share with the world. Oh you know? yeah. Because you're, you're, you're teaching others what is happening and what can happen, but you're, um, it's so hard to keep all that stuff inside, you know, and, and yes. I definitely recommend therapy and doing all those things too, but there's something, Absolutely. it can be used as a very therapeutic tool, you know, if people feel mm. comfortable doing that. And I feel like I've seen, you know, someone that I know hide for a long time that they've dealt with some mm. really chronic illness and then they finally put it out there and they just breathe the sigh of relief, right? Because yes. that is truly showing the world, you know, I don't want to say who they are because I don't think chronic illness mm. defines you, but it shows mm. what you are experiencing and what you're going through yeah. on this very, you know, intimate level yeah. that, um, that gives, it's a, it's in a, um, a good energy exchange. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it humanizes you. That's yep. all. It just, it just, mm. it, it, it just means you're not superwoman yep. and you're a human being. Right. Yep. And, and that's what I shared a lot of this, like when my daughter was born, because mm -hmm. I've got two kids, my son is the younger one. And I wrote a lot about just the transition I was mm -hmm. going through, you know, the transitions we, we really talk about mm -hmm. as travelers mm -hmm. and that's that our value decreases the minute we become care takers. Yeah. Yeah, even though imagine. the society doesn't say it, because then the jobs reduce and everything. And then I will, I and I wrote, I was like, 
I was, I was still trying to prove to everybody that I could do everything. I was right. a superwoman. I just had a baby. I could do this. And I'm like, I'm not superwoman. Right. And I wrote all and this. You shouldn't have to be. Yeah. And I don't have to be, you know, mm-hmm. and I have to, and I have to, um, just, uh, settle in the fact that this is a huge life transition as well. Yeah. So, oh, so those are the kind of things I shared publicly, you know, the mm-hmm. things that I felt like maybe it will connect to other moms mm-hmm. going through this mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So it's, so it's about finding what you feel could resonate as well with other people, you know, mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. um, you know, you know, just going through this kind of, okay, what's it like being a mom with two kids? Yeah. Well, I don't blog, I, I don't, I'm not a family blogger, you know, mm-hmm. so I don't blog about that every day. Right, and, I right. don't have to, and I don't have to be because that was not why I got into travel. Right. But I can share mm-hmm. some of my experiences and stuff. So yeah, it's uh, very interesting. You know? I love it. <laughs> I love everything that you've done. And I'm so glad that you came on and chatted oh, with you. me today. It's been so amazing. And um, oh, thank you. To, to know, obviously, you know, um, a good chunk of your story, but I really was excited to get into these specifics um, of how, how you've done all of this and how, you know, mm. you approach the world, because I think, um, it's, as I said already, it's super inspirational and it always makes mm, me feel you. like, all right, like, you know, <laughs> like I can hunker down and do more. <laughs> like, look at this woman <laughs> who's doing like all this stuff. So well, I feel the same way when I see, I'm like, Oh my God, you know, Kristen is amazing dancing, doing all this stuff, staying in shape. This great diet, and I'm like, you know what? I could, I could go for a walk at least once in a while. I could at least do that around my block. Uh, we've all got our things, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. So let yeah. people know where they can contact you and find out more about mm-hmm. you. Yeah, so I am online, uh, just akimade.com, mm-hmm. a k i n m a d e.com, and there are links to my social media and stuff there. So um, without sounding conceited, I'm easy to find. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I'm all over the web. Yeah. Well, I definitely recommend, you know, following you on Instagram because you get to see a lot of your photography that way, which yeah. is Thank you. so wonderful. Um, you know, that, that's the, that's the beauty of Instagram, right? When it comes to photography, yes. it's, it's a really yes. great place to, to witness that. So, um, I, yeah, so appreciate you being here today and I look forward to continuing to watch, you know, all the amazing things that you do in the world. Oh, thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you for having me. For sure. All right, you guys, I'll see you next week.